I'm not going to keep you from your lunch or transport for too long, but uh, there's been a lot of things going on. And I, I just wanted to say, I think this has been the best Stroke Club conference ever yet. I mean, everybody's been so friendly and there's been a great atmosphere. And I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. It's been fantastic. Maybe you should all give yourself a clap because it's been a great at atmosphere. Um, I was going to do some sort of talking over things that I'd, I'd uh, been in workshops and so on, but there's actually so much going on. I just wanted to share some big things with you so that you can go back knowing a bit more about what's happening in the, the big world of stroke. Um, so the first thing I want to say is that the, the Stroke Association itself has been rewriting its strategy, its strategy for the next three years. Uh, I don't know how many of you realise how very difficult it's been during this coalition government. Um, we've seen the stroke networks uh, shut down. We've seen the stroke improvement programme shut down. As Joe said yesterday, the national stroke strategy has been pushed into the long grass. It's no longer on the NHS website or on the, uh, the Department of Health website. The community uh, funding that was ring fence for stroke was shut down three weeks into the start of this new coalition government. So when I get a bit depressed about what might happen <laughs> after the next election, you can see why. Um, so we, we, we really do all have to stand together. So we've been thinking, what do we need to do over the next three years uh, to try and make sure that we keep stroke at the top? And, and we went out and we've, we've surveyed over 4,000 stakeholders and I think many of you um, would have actually returned uh, questionnaires back to us. Um, and so we've got lots of uh, views and I'll, I'll share some of those in a second. I think the important thing though is you can see from this graph that's up there that stroke is now the second biggest killer in the world. It's also the number one cause of severe disability. And for those of us who've been affected by, by stroke or had loved ones who've been affected by stroke, it's always, it's incredible to me that stroke does not get the prominence that it should get in the medical world when you look at those sorts of statistics. Uh, it, it's unbelievable. Um, in the research that we've done in terms of putting the new strategy together, there are various issues that we, we found were repeatedly coming up from stroke survivors and their families. Uh, and these were things such as fatigue. Uh, and fatigue is really something that the researchers are not looking into because maybe it's not as exciting as thrombolysis or, or other exciting things that happen in the stroke unit. But for many people, fatigue is a really debilitating impact of stroke over the rest of their life. And there are also things such as post-stroke um, uh, depression, um, the emotional impact of stroke, not only on the stroke survivor, but on the changing relationships that occur after a stroke. So we, we, want, to, we want to pick up on some of these things over the next three years and see if we can make some progress. And one of the ways that we're going to do that is that we're going to try and grow uh, a new generation of stroke researchers who are going to be very much more focused on the issues that stroke survivors themselves are actually saying are the important issues. We're also going to be diverting some of our stroke research money into psychological consequences of stroke and vascular dementia. Um, people talk about dementia, don't they? And they always think that dementia is Alzheimer's. What is the second biggest cause of dementia? It's stroke. Stroke causes dementia. And again, we see stroke gets relegated out of the picture somehow when we're talking about this. So, so there's a lot of work that needs, needs to be done. And I would say that um, hemorrhagic stroke, which uh, Edwin Collins had a hemorrhagic stroke, um, there's not been an awful lot of research into what to do with it and how to deal with it and so on and so forth. So we're also going to divert some research funding into that area because it's largely an area that needs a lot more work. We have made progress though on research funding and if you, I know this table is a bit busy but if you actually look at it you can go back to 2007 
and you'll see that the total amount of money spent on stroke research was 23 million. Miserable, of course, compared to the 590 million spent on cancer. But by 2011 12, we had actually forced that amount of money up to 58 million, which is almost, a, well, it is a beyond a doubling of what was being spent those years before. So we are gradually getting there. And one of the things we want to do out of the, the next strategy is to actually move towards trying to get more money to go into stroke research to find um, cures. We asked people as part of the research, if you had £10 to donate, what would you want your money to go towards? And you can see, and I'm changing the figure around a little bit, you can see that the most popular thing that the public wanted to donate money for in stroke was research to prevent stroke and then to improve treatments after stroke. But the second most important thing was supporting people to recover from stroke. And third most important was educating the public on how to reduce their risk of having a stroke. So that's, that's a, a prevention. But also, people were saying that we should campaign more and we should get out there and say more about stroke and we should really push the, push the thing forward around stroke being such a, a critical issue for us to, to face. And so we want to, uh, as part of the next three years, really campaign hard and work to get that 58 million research spend up to 150 million a year. And there's no reason why we shouldn't do that. Um, the picture I've put there is of a, a, a person who's actually in charge of the uh, number 10 cabinet office on science and, and research. Um, and you can see she's speaking with the Stroke Association logo behind. And she supports that notion that there should be more money going into stroke research. So we're starting from a reasonable place. And let's all cross fingers and work hard together. And hopefully we can do that. Uh, and that will bring forward more cures and maybe treatments uh, for the future. I just wanted to switch over a bit to say, on a worldwide basis, stroke is now the second biggest killer, but the dark areas on this world map are those areas where stroke is actually the number one killer in those countries. And it's quite incredible when you look at that area that stretches from Eastern Europe right the way across through, through Russia and so on. Um, and I think the other surprising fact for many people is that Africa, uh, that stroke is the number one killer in many parts of Africa. In, I, I think not many people um, are really aware of that. And this one is quite interesting because it shows that those areas of the globe where stroke is the number one killer are often those areas of the globe where there are no stroke associations, no stroke clubs, nobody out there actually advocating for there to be a national strategy, health strategy in those countries to deal with stroke.